Good evening, everyone. I would like to start my talk by asking a question. Who of you has ever been in a slum? Show of hands, please. That's actually more than I expected. That's good. OK, so for those of you who have been there, but mostly for the, mostly for the people who have not been there, these are a couple of definitions of um, the Oxford Dictionary, for example. Usually they are squalid and overcrowded, inhabited by the poor, unfit even for human habitation. Again, poor people and housing are in bad condition. And this one I really liked. It's a very untidy place. <laughs> <laughs> a very untidy place. It's a very Western way of looking at it. It's almost like your mom is going, eh, it's kind of dirty. <laughs> Over there, we don't want to live there. So if I would just give you these definitions, you would say these people must be the most unhappy people in the world, right? Bad housing conditions, unfit for human habitation. These must be the most unhappy people in the world. Well, I've been to slums. I've been to slums in Gambia, in Kenya, most recently to the slums of Indonesia, uh, where they are called Kampung. And this is what I found. Happy people. <laughs> uh, actually, to be fair, it took me approximately one or two days to see the happy people, because as a profession, well, I'm a building engineer, so the first thing I do is I look at the housing, and the housing quality is poor, that's true. So the first thing on my mind was, oh, people must be very unhappy here, they don't have a proper home, children are running around in conditions that I would not like my children to be running around in. And then I looked <laughs> properly at the people and I took pictures, and usually people are pretty happy, actually. So why is that? <laughs> why is uh, my perception completely wrong? But actually, I noticed that the communities in these areas are extremely strong. They're very resilient. People take care of their own. There's almost no unemployment. Everybody has a job. It's just that their, how that their income is uh, not up to our standards. People make money with their house. People are having uh, shops on their front lawn of their own house. They have motor shops. They have um, <coughs> barber shops. They sell food. They have their own restaurants. Uh, people communicate uh, enormously much. They have smartphones and even tablets. So, um, but mostly these areas are actually extremely flexible. These people can adapt. So if something happens in such an area, they can extremely fast adapt. Actually, way more faster than we can in our European cities. So while these are all uh, good things, and actually I want to show that these areas have value, there is still a problem over here which is the build quality of housing. It's just so poor. And I saw people or children running around in housing where I thought, well, that house is going to come down when an earthquake hits or something. So there is a problem. Now, the governments or municipalities in these areas are trying to tackle this problem by just tearing down such an area. In Indonesia and Kampung, this is a Kampung. They just tear down the whole area. They build a couple of flats in a corner of the land um, in which they put the people, they're like, okay, you have a safe home now, you have a small apartment, you have a safe roof over your head, there you go, and they sell the rest of the ground to, uh, to ground developers. In this way, the government makes money, people have a safe home, you would say win-win situation, right? Now, this is thought of very much in the short term, and in the long term, uh, it shows that these people have lost uh, their way of living, they have lost their ability to make money with their house, uh, you tear apart all business owners uh, and all business community, which usually is just a well-functioning uh, ecosystem in itself, and you tear apart all the communities. So these people are actually um, being put inside a place where they do not want to be. And if you look at, for example, China, this is how ghost cities appear. The government is trying to tackle this problem from a top-down perspective, the hand of God. We say, you're going to live like this, you're going to be in here. And the people say, well, we don't want to live like that. These kinds of areas are completely empty. People move out to the outskirts of the city. They build their own house over there. Because in Indonesia, 80% of the uh, housing is self-built. So you can imagine, that's not just the poorest of the poor, that's also the mid-class, that's you and me, who are building our own house. And as you can imagine, that if you are living in such a strong community, you do not want to live here. So that's not a solution. So while this is not the right approach, in my opinion, this top-down uh, approach, 
something needs to happen. This is Haiti after the earthquake hit. These areas are not, uh, these building uh, materials and building uh, methods they are using are not adequate uh, to cope with earthquakes. This is Jakarta after the floods. The boy is now using it as a pool, so he got something, well, maybe positive out of it, but yeah, it's quite unsafe. Children are still, spl still uh, playing around here. So if we, from an engineering point of view, look at what they're doing now, how are they building houses? Well, usually it's uh, brickwork because it's easy to build. They build one story, maybe even two, and build on top of that uh, a roof. Now you can imagine that if a flood's hit this, or an earthquake, or simply if it's not constructed properly, the whole thing will come down, roof included, which is unsafe. What is needed is like a proper structure, one or two stories high, that actually is the safe skeleton of your house, that actually uh, takes care of, of all these forces coming uh, into your house, and make sure that the roof doesn't come down in the end. So if you look at what is available, in these areas. What can I use to build such a structure? You have bamboo, there's wood, and concrete. This is all what is locally available. So let's take a look at bamboo. It's a great material from an engineering point of view. It's extremely strong, it's durable, uh, it's very cheap, grows everywhere in the world, grows very fast as well. Um, it has a lot of tensile strength, so great for use, you would say. Problem is, and this maybe some of you who have been to slum have seen this, bamboo is seen as a poor man's timber. Only the poorest of the poor who cannot do anything else build with this material. And actually in Indonesia, maybe it's because bamboo is hollow, they're completely convinced that bamboo houses ghosts. So you would never build your house and then live in between the ghosts. So it's a superstition that people might laugh about, but it's, uh, it's something that makes sure that Whatever you give these people here and you say, well, build with bamboo, they will never do that. So you need to take into account what people think over there, <coughs> what they will live in, what they will not live in. So their own cultural values. So bamboo, no. Wood is a pretty material to build with. Problem with wood is that it's usually too expensive for these people. Uh, it's either not available or local climate um, is not very suited to wood. So the very hot and humid climate um, deteriorates the wood or rodents um, eat away at it. So no wood. So that leaves us with concrete, which if uh, it's not the first thing that springs to mind from an engineering point of view, but if you sort of uh, see all the solutions and take like local conditions into account, it actually works pretty well, especially if you think that people are already using concrete right now. They usually just do it in a very wrong way. Do we have any building engineers in the audience? None. <laughs> All right, so I'll explain this. What they usually do is they build two brick walls. They sort of slap together uh, a couple of wooden boards, which gives you a hollow sort of column. They pour concrete in that. They put some reinforcement in there. Um, and then you get this. Problem is, if you do not do it properly, your reinforcement comes out wrong. In this case, they just sort of thought, well, it's crooked now, we'll just bend it backwards and then build on top of that. It's a logical way of thinking. Problem is that if it's exposed to air, the reinforcement here, it actually uh, rusts your uh, reinforcement. So your steel is rusting. And when steel is rusting, it expands inside your concrete, which is bad. Your concrete cracks, all cohesion with your concrete is lost. And you would think, oh, this is a house, it has a concrete structure, it's proper, like, goes against floods, so that's good. But no, when the flood comes, this still comes down, especially if you build multiple stories up with these kind, uh, kind of construction. So when I was mentioning the concrete structures, as you see here, um, people need a way of building these things safe, but they still need to self-build their house. They need a way to make a safe concrete structure which they can fill, for example, uh, sorry, it's no longer working. Can I have the next slide? <laughs> well, I'll just tell you, the slide will come up anyway. So people can fill this structure actually with brickwork, like they're already doing now. They can already build a brick wall, they just cannot build a safe structure around it. 
And when I went to the kampongs of Indonesia and I wanted to research into, do you guys want to build a safer house? Um, their answer was, meh, I'm not sure. If I want a safer house, I have a house. Why does it need to be safer? Because in their perception, safety is something completely different from what we perceive it. For us, safety is a house that doesn't collapse in a flood. And for them, it's sort of a way of life. It sort of belongs within. That's not their motivation to build with this type of uh, concrete structures. They did say, well, if you have a concrete structure, can you build up multiple stories high? I said, yes, of course, you can build up to three or four stories high with these, uh, these kind of concrete structures. I said, ah, that's important because I have a family and it's expanding and I want a place for the baby and I want a place for my family. I want an extra shop on the ground floor. I might maybe want to rent out some houses. I can make more money with my house. I can keep my family in one place because horizontally, these areas are completely built full. You cannot expand in a horizontal way. So you need to go vertical. And that's actually something that uh, this concrete framework system can do for people. I'm actually not sure if I'm doing this or you're doing this. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> All right. So my fascination as a building engineer was to think of a way to enable these people to self-build their house in a safe way. To stop top-down solution, hand of God, determine how they're going to live. No, give them the means and the knowledge to do, do it themselves. So this last year and the coming year, uh, I've been working on a system that does just that. I'm developing uh, a formwork system. Um, and the formwork system is just a technical term for a mold in which you pour concrete. Um, this system is uh, lighter than commonly used uh, system. Uh, it's flexible, it can be used in these areas, it's, it's more cheap than what they currently use. So it's something I'm working on to try to figure out um, how, to how to tackle this problem. Um, because if we're looking at numbers of slums in the future and the growing population, I'm going to give you some numbers to, to show you. The urbanization rate uh, of our population right now, 2015, we have reached a tipping point. Uh, we're at 50%. So 50% of our world population is living in cities right now. And it's expected for 2050, so only 35 years from now, that's going to be 70%. It's a lot. Looking at numbers, right now, it's 4 billion people living in cities, almost. For 2050, this number is almost going to double. Right now, this moment, one, million, one billion people are living in slums. So one fourth of our uh, urban population is living in slums. It is, however, estimated um, for 2050 that half of our urban population is going to be living in slums. So the biggest urban growth that's going to take place in the coming years, in the coming 35 years, is going to be in what we call slums, which are actually not the slums that you perceive to be, they're just self-built neighborhoods, as, as I like to call them. Areas where people build their own house because the government cannot run fast enough to keep up with the urban growth that is happening right now. And we're going to need safe solutions for this. So city growth is unavoidable. It's going to come one way or another, left or right. Um, Self-built housing is going to grow enormously in the coming time. That's going to happen one way or another. I think uh, it, hel it helps already to, uh, to change our perspective of how we view slums, for example, and think of ways where if we could enable this group of people <coughs> to build their own house in a safe way, that they could actually help build our cities of the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>